and good evening, everyone. I want to welcome you to TRIO Philadelphia Chapters, July of 2000, yeah, 20, uh, 21, <laughs> yeah, I got this, 2021, July of 2021. We're in the uh, midst of this COVID uh, at the present time. That's why you see Susan wearing a mask. And um, we have a great speaker with us tonight, phenomenal. Um, just a little bit of background. Uh, as most of you know, I was uh, transplanted in uh, June of 2015 with my heart transplant. And I'm recovering at home in uh, July of 2015. And um, a story, local story, kind of caught my eye uh, about the first bilateral hand transplant done in Philadelphia. And not only was this a local story, but then I saw it was a national story. And then it went to an international story. And then, of course, they talk about the Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, and also something very near and dear to me as a Pennsylvania Mason, the Shriners. And me being a Shrine the Shriner with Lulu Temple in Plymouth meeting going, wow. Wow, this is incredible. And of course, who's at the center of all this attention but our guest this evening, Dr. L. Scott Levin. Uh, Dr. Levin has really been around the block with things. He's uh, trained um, with his pediatric orthopedic uh, surgery at Schreiner Hospitals. Uh, and then he did uh, uh, congenial hand surgery at Duke for almost 20 years. And of course, he lands uh, with us at Penn, um, both trained in orthopedics and plastic surgery, uh, doing pediatric microsurgery, pediatric hand surgery, pediatric reconstruction surgery. And really, this sets the stage for what we're going to be talking about tonight. And that is vascularized composite allo transplantation. Uh, so that uh, we'll hear a little bit more about. Uh, so with that, I want to turn things over to our guest, Dr. Levin. Well, thank you so much and want to recognize Jim Gleason on the national scene. Uh, Bob Goodman, I know, I've, I think we've met uh, either through you, know, or I can't exactly remember where. And uh, let's see if I can share my screen. Uh, there we go. How are we doing so far, Bill? You are doing terrific. So um, first of all, uh, I'm going to talk about an aspect of transplantation, uh, this so-called uh, vascularized composite aloe transplant. It's been around now uh, for 23 years. The first unilateral hand transplant was done in a New Zealand prisoner by Max DuBernard. And DuBernard was a Frenchman who sadly just passed away at the age of 80. He was in the uh, Budapest airport and may have been lecturing. And I digress a little bit, but as I look at the screen, first of all, Susan reminded me that she's my high school classmate. Uh, you know, it's been uh, 50 years, I guess, since I've seen her, 5-0, right, Susan? And, uh, you know, uh, it's a true honor um, I've gotten interested in transplant uh, a very long time ago, probably the last, uh, well, uh, ever since the first hand transplant was done in the United States by my friend Warren Breidenbach in, in uh, 1999. Uh, and let's see if I can advance here. Uh, so before I get started with my formal comments, Number one, I want to recognize each one of you. When I see a patient that I know has had a solid organ transplant in the clinic, before I got into this field, it's like, oh, ho, hum, Bill Soloway has a heart. Okay, Bill, what's your orthopedic problem? Now I get genuinely excited. I'm looking at Jim on the screen. What medicines are you on? What's your tack level? You know, uh, how long have you had your transplant? Who did your transplant? I actually start to really embrace the transplant community. And I've done that with um, Howard Nathan and Rick Haas and the Gift of Life and the Penn Transplant Institute. And we'll get into all that, but these are my disclosures. 
Uh, I've had support from the Department of Defense and the Hans-Jörg Wies Foundation. I, <clears throat> I want to disclose this to you, uh, and that's for research in uh, VCA. So I, I really love history, uh, medical history, surgical history. And this fellow here, before transplant was even conceived of, Sir Charles Bell was a, uh, a Scottish uh, surgeon in the uh, you know, latter part of the 18th century. And he said the following, pay attention team, hands are the ready instruments of the mind. Let me say it again, hands are the ready instruments of the mind. So way back, you know, uh, just before, you know, he was born two years before, you know, Ben Franklin, I guess, signed the Declaration of Independence. He made a correlation that the brain is connected to the hand. Now, when you think about that, there was no x-ray, there were no antibiotics, there certainly was no MRI. Neurology was, you know, who knows, people used to feel souls to make a diagnosis. That's how far back in archaic medicine was. But Bell seriously correlated the function of the human hand uh, that linked it to the mind, obviously through the spinal cord and the nerve roots and so forth. So just keep that in mind. So again, keeping with the theme of history, you know, these are two people that I'm I'm sure you know or may know of through TRIO, which um, as I get to know all of you is an organization I'm so proud to present to. You know, I've taken this story around the world into colleagues and peers and medical groups and transplant organizations and on the national and local scene. But I actually want to recognize Joe Murray uh, and um, Bill mentioned this, I'm, I'm also a plastic surgeon. And so I've, I've met Dr. Murray and actually Dr. Murray, you know, was a craniofacial surgeon. He got to start doing burns at the Peter Van Brigham Hospital in Boston. And you all probably are gonna laugh at me because I'm gonna give you the names of some books that I'm sure you've read, but raise your hand if you've read the book by Joe Murray, Surgery of the Soul. Has anybody read that? Okay. Jim, I got you. So Surgery of the Soul is a book that you can get on Amazon, I guess, like anything else in the world, it was a, a book written by Joe Murray, who did the first kidney transplant in 1954, the, the so-called uh, Herrick twins. And, you know, this is uh, 68 years ago, uh, no immunosuppression needed, sort of like the Hallmark case of the child because little Zion was already immunosuppressed, but I'm jumping ahead, Bill, and I'll come back to Zion's story. So Dr. Murray was an extremely humble, beloved figure in American surgery. And of course, won in 1990, the Nobel Prize in Medicine for doing the first kidney transplant. Here's a plastic surgeon, the craniofacial surgery, and yet he won the Nobel Prize. And actually there's a letter behind me on my wall that you can't see that Joe Murray wrote me because I took care of his son-in-law's mother when I was in Durham, North Carolina. She fractured her wrist and I fixed her wrist. And she said, you wouldn't happen to know a Dr. Murray, would you? And I said, well, ma'am, the only Dr. Murray I know is Joe Murray from Boston. She goes, that's who I'm talking about. Of course, I almost decompensated because here's, a Nobel Prize winner in medicine looking over my shoulder, but you know, Dr. Murray was incredibly gracious. And then I had the occasion to meet Tom Starzl, who in 1967 did the first uh, liver transplant. And, and before that, or actually I think it's when he attempted it, the other book, how many, raise your hand, have read The Puzzle People? Has anybody read that book? So Jim, you've seen that book. And I, you know, as transplant recipients, you know, you may or may not want to read that, but the story of how they got to liver and kidney, how the world accepted liver transplant that's helped so many people. And by the way, I do all the artery repairs for the living donor liver transplants. You know, there's a entire liver and then we also 
have what we call living donor liver transplant, where a portion of, as you all well know, most likely, a healthy um, patient will donate his or her portion of the liver to a relative or a child and so forth. So I do all that work in addition to the um, hand transplants. And that, just as an aside comment to all of you, is so rewarding because it's, you know, of course, like all of you, it's a life and death surgery. The, the hookup of the artery has to go well, but what it does, it's like I was talking about meeting transplant recipients in my clinic when I'm seeing them for another reason. It keeps me in the, in the, in the story. It keeps me engaged in transplant. The fact that I have this small little part helping the team in selected liver uh, it just energizes me. I, I just can't tell you how much that means because the hand transplants or the face transplants, as you may know, are, are few and far between, okay, just to say it. We do, you know, infinitely more livers and kidneys and hearts and lungs than we do hands and faces and penis and abdominal wall uh, and uterus transplant, but hopefully that'll change. So coming back to Starzl, Tom Starzl was a true inspiration um, because you may know that the first liver that he transplanted, again, a little more history, the three-year-old child died on the operating table. The child bled to death in his hands in Denver when he, when he did the first liver. And I can tell you, had I done my first hand transplant and the patient would have had a calamitous complication. I, I don't know where I'd be today. I, I probably would have quit. So Starzl, the late Thomas Starzl, who won the Presidential Medal of Freedom from President Bush, he was awarded for his contributions. He didn't get the Nobel Prize, said to me, uh, and this is at a meeting in Austria. We were in the Salzburg airport, and I asked my wife to take a picture of Tom Starzl and I, and it's sort of like E.F. Hutton, he talks and I listen. And this is a very meaningful picture to me because he was a, was a giant in the field of transplant. And, you know, reading his book uh, just inspired me and also trained where my surgical mentor trained at Johns Hopkins uh, with Dave Saviston, who perfected Cardiac bypass. So uh, I'm going to stop you one second. Yeah. You know what Dr. Starzl's connection is to TRIO? Jim, if I would know better, I would probably say he started the organization. You're absolutely right. I just had to add that to your, your history there. You know, I, I, I so much appreciate that because uh, these little things, and, and all of you, and I, I'm trying to state this humbly. Mark my words, the history that I've lived probably the last 15 or 20 years um, as my career unfolds and, and God willing, all of you, whoever you pray to will live a long life. You're seeing the history of VCA, vascularized composite allotransplant evolve. And it's said, Jim, that we stand on the shoulders of giants. And Starzl was a true giant, but we stand on the shoulders of giants without Joe Murray. And you'll all forgive me for going on and on, but every time I talk, I get excited about this field because it's nice to talk to people who are interested. At least I hope so, so far. So I'm gonna actually talk to you about four patients. And um, uh, the first one is Lindsay S. And this is all done by permission. Now. All of you had physiologic needs and life-saving needs, Bill. Uh, you know, you and uh, uh, Brian with his lung transplant. Without them, I don't have to remind you, uh, you, you wouldn't survive. And so not only can I see both of you and all of you on the screen have a good quality of life, but you're living. BCA is a little different in that you can see this girl uh, her name's Lindsay S. She was a beautiful VCU, um, majored in fashion marketing. She herself was a fashion model. 
the age of 22, had a, a very handsome fiance. She had an inner abdominal catastrophe. She became septic. She developed a massive infection. And in order to save her life, the doctors, when she was in the intensive care unit, had to amputate her legs below the knee and her arms below the elbow. So she went from totally independent to totally dependent. You can see here, she's not really wearing the body powered artificial arms that are lying on the floor. Uh, a look of hopelessness, I think you'll agree, and this wasn't staged. And she's lost her connection to the world. Okay, she's lost her connection to the world without hands. The inability to hold hands, to feed herself, to close herself, to toilet herself, to interact. And so she came to see me at Duke in, um, I guess, uh, 2007 or 2008. No, 2007, because I moved to Penn in 2009. She was sent to me by one of my fellows, Jay Desai, who I trained in hand surgery. He knew I was interested in this field. Okay, so now we're going back, Bill, 14 years at least. She was the first patient that came to me, and Duke didn't even have a program. But she was referred down, and she came with her boyfriend. Now, it was a couple months after her catastrophe. Again, living, functioning, engaged one day, septic and almost died and loss of all four limbs, what's called a quadrilateral, excuse me, a quadrimembranal amputee. She's a quadrimembranal amputee. And she came in with her fiance at the time and said, well, um, do I get my hand transplants from you first and then we have a baby? Or should I have a baby and then after the baby, will you give me hand transplants? I almost fell off my chair. And I had to say to her, Lindsay, um, we're trying to get a program established and you all can appreciate she was the first person that was referred to me and, and the team that I was trying to form at Duke to do a transplant. And needless to say, I got nowhere with the institution. She followed me to the University of Pennsylvania. I kept saying, come back, come back. By the way, the next time she came for the second visit to Duke to clarify the transplant procedure. There was no boyfriend. There was no fiance. She was with her mother. And obviously he abandoned her. And then she was totally dependent on her mother. There was no fiance. So you can think about the challenges that this poor girl faced losing her limbs and then losing her fiance and the uh, stress and the trauma emotionally and physically. And she's a gorgeous young lady. You know, she really is. So I didn't know what the heck to say to her. And then uh, I moved to Penn and I'll continue with my history lesson. So in 2009, don't forget, I think she came to me in 2007. In 2009, I came to Penn and where I was shut down by the transplant program at Duke chair of surgery, the hospital, nobody was interested. They thought I was crazy. And, you know, we're not going to support this. And we're not ready. And that's not why I left Duke. But I came and I arrived at Duke, uh, excuse me, I arrived at Penn, having spent 27 years at Duke. I was the chief of plastic surgery, moved and became the chair of orthopedics. Um, I met this guy, Abraham Shaked, Avi Shaked. Bill, you probably know of him. Everybody's shaking their head. Robert, you know him. And he's, he's a force of nature. He's become a brother. Uh, we actually live in the same apartment across the hall from one another. The most incredible, dynamic, talented, hardworking person in transplant. And he's like the older brother I never had. And I was walking in the hallway in July of 2009, having been you know, dismissed at Duke for trying to create a hand transplant program. And I said, Dr. Shaked, I'm Scott Levin. I'm new to Penn. I'd like to do, start a hand transplant program. And in his heavy Israeli accent, he said, sure, why not? So um, this is the cadaver lab that I built 
to do surgical rehearsals. And this is our team. And I put together the team, multidisciplinary team, uh, all of my partners, everybody who does hand surgery. And this is us rehearsing for Lindsay. And so another quote, um, not from uh, Sir Charles Bell, but good old Ben Franklin, by failing to prepare, you're preparing to fail. And all of you have had successful transplants. And um, I don't think you take it for granted, and I say that humbly and respectfully to you, but transplant surgery is very challenging, even when everything goes right. You know, it's timing, it's in the middle of the night, it's this and that. So here's our cadaver lab, and we spent two years working on the logistics of how to do a transplanted pen for Lindsay. And this is the process we designed. You can see who's doing what, fixing the bones, the tendons, the arteries, the nerves. Brian, we hook up your pulmonary artery and your, your bronchus, man, and you got some lungs. Uh, it's a little more formidable when we transplant hands with all the different structures. But some of you have heard of Atul Gawande, who's off, also up in Boston. And this is literally the clipboard. And we wrote down every step so that we wouldn't make a mistake. And we practiced this in the cadaver lab, did hand transplant cadaveric rehearsals customized for Lindsay for about a year and a half. Everybody assembled at night. The nurses came without compensation. I bought people a box lunch and we learned and studied and prepared to do Lindsay's operation. And so a little more than two years after I arrived at Penn, remember I had to build the cadaver lab so we could rehearse. Here she is doing CrossFit. And the unique thing about Lindsay is her arms were transplanted at the level of the elbow. So the nerves from her as the recipient had to grow into the muscles and animate the muscles in her donor forearm which is very formidable. In other words, if the nerves don't grow back, I can vascularize the new transplanted hands, right? But if they don't function and their fingers don't move, I've done her a disservice. But here she is doing CrossFit. And of course, she's in her, with pride, her lower extremity transplant. So she's gone from a quadrimembranal to fully independent function, driving, teaching CrossFit, and you, you have to agree, not only is she a determined young lady, but I'd say by any standard, she's a very attractive uh, young woman. And I'm so proud of her. Of interest, um, 10 years later, because of her uh, immunosuppression, uh, unavoidable, she got a kidney transplant because her creatinine went up, you know, with her multi-organ system failure. Uh, she had, you know, some uh, renal insufficiency but this is the first transplant at Duke. And may I remind all of you, and you all know this, that research is a huge component. Um, this is work that I did at Duke in the animal lab, because just to digress a second, I said, if they're not gonna let me do hands at Duke, maybe I'll find a patient that's immunosuppressed, that has a kidney or a liver, that needs an abdominal wall reconstruction. Now, you know, Bill, your chest wall and, 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 and Brian, your chest wall and others on the call, you have a, a good abdomen and chest, but you can imagine, Bill, maybe a heart transplant's done and something happens to the chest wall, you may need a new chest. And we could get it from another donor because you're already immunosuppressed. So to make a long story short, I did this research trying to prove to Duke University. See, it was published in July, 2010, but I started working on this in 2008, never knowing that I would do a transplant in a patient already immunosuppressed. So here's the little boy that Bill Soloway was talking about. This is Zion. His mom, Patty Ray, is sitting here. And at two years old, just like Lindsay, he got sick and he became septic. And imagine a parent being told in order to save your child's life, we have to cut his hands off and his legs off. So that's what happened to Zion. Only he required from his mother a living donor kidney transplant 
because of renal insufficiency. This is Ben Chang, my partner and co-director. And this is, again, we had just finished Lindsay in 2011. And about two years later, Zion comes along. So I had to establish a completely new program for pediatric hand transplant at CHOP, which I did with the ethics committee, with the IRB, with the nurses, with the ICUs, with the rehearsals. It took us two years as a team to prepare for him. And this is what he looked like at two. And of course, this is what he looked like when he came to see me, a little younger. But he had a living donor kidney. He was immunosuppressed, but no arms uh, and no legs. Now, let me just stop and praise and rejoice over UNOS. I had the privilege of being the um, national a committee chair for VCA. Want to give a shout out to Gift of Life, uh, Howard Nathan, Rick Haas, the team here in Philadelphia. Those of you who know them, text them, email them, say I love them, and I'll say it publicly because I do. And they have been the greatest partners and champions of VCA and, and Gift of Life. And UNOS has a separate VCA committee for face for abdominal wall, for uterus, for hands, uh, and penile transplant. So I can't say enough things about the regulatory uh, environment in which we've done this ethically and with donor uh, sensitivity. I'll have you know that when we take a face or we take a hand for VCA or hands, we create prosthetics for the donor. So we have reestablished the donor identity and body image so that the family who is so gracious in donation, as you can imagine, can see their loved one with, you know, a, a moulage, a, a face mimicking their own. And so there's a lot of intricacy here. And of course, with solid organ, right, we don't have to do that. So here are some technical things we worked out. We have these cutting guides. This is Zion surgery. We have all these different structures. We have to hook up. There are labels. Uh, the operation took about 12 hours. And this is uh, like Goldilocks, the parge is too hot, too cold, just right. We had to determine, and this comes back to UNOS and big data, that you can see that this is a plastic model that was extrapolated from a Zion at the time of preparing for transplant of the size of the hand we need. So Perfect size hand on a donor would look like in the middle. We figured we can get smaller hands at about 80% and a little bigger hands at 120, but anything beyond this range, are you with me so far? They would be too big or too small. So this is what we needed. This is the donor. I don't know if you can see my arrow moving, Bill. So we were within two or three millimeters and if I have you remember one thing tonight, there are only 15 children in the country at any one year that would be suitable as a donor, 15 kids. And then we have to find a family at a terrible time that would say, okay, you can use my child's hands for another child. So um, coming to books I've read, failure is not an option. This is Gene Krantz who put a man on the moon. Uh, you remember Apollo 13 and just like Tom Starzl, I didn't want to fail uh, with Zion. And so he, here he is in the hospital. This is uh, two weeks in. And because he had his muscles and his tendons, he didn't have hands. He'd always able, he was already able to grasp this action figure. And again, as Bill Soloway mentioned at the beginning of the hour, um, this is my team. And it was the nurses and the anesthesiologists and the residents and the fellows. And it was... You know, we had prepared two years for this. And then the day that the donation came, I was actually in Montana, July 5th, visiting a friend and flew back and then jumped in a, another plane and we went out and did the procurement. And uh, the rest is sort of history, but you know, eight or nine hand surgeons here attending Zadala from the shrine. Uh, here's Scotty Cozen who runs the shrine, Steinberg, I mean, this is a cast of thousands. And of course, uh, as Bill said, this resonated locally, regionally, nationally, and uh, internationally, because it was a first.
sort of like when Christian Bernard did the first heart transplant, uh, or, you know, some way here in this country in Starzl with the liver. And there's Al Roker with Zion. Uh, and he was on the Today Show. And this was picked up uh, all over the place. But if we remember, I said, you know, the hands are the ready instrument of the mind. So we figured, wait a second, what happened with Zion? At the age of two, he lost his hands. So you know, the relationship, his brain didn't develop. The centers in the brain for fingers, thumb, hand, muscle movement, they didn't develop. So what the heck's going to happen when we put hands on Zion? Is his brain going to catch up? Does his brain know that he now has hands? Because he was two when he lost his hands and eight when he regained hands. So the brain was basically dormant at that time. And so we worked with our pediatric neurologists to do all these sophisticated studies. They didn't exist at the time of Charles Bell or even in 1954 when Murray did the first kidney. But we were able to study the centers in his brain, the so-called homunculus, and the centers grew as his transplant matured and his nerves started to grow. And so here he is about a year later, uh, and this is his function. And these are the transplanted hands uh, with the peg test, uh, which is um, how we measure dexterity. You can see he has an opposable thumb and none of this would have been possible. He rejected prosthetics, right? Here he is with marbles. Pretty cool, huh? And he, he does rock climbing, he plays the cello. He's now 14 and very, very functional. So here he is uh, eating a sandwich. And so our reputation following Lindsay and then Zion, this fellow here, his name is Laurent Lantieri and you'd have no reason to know him other than he has also made history on the world. He's done eight face transplants in Paris, and their politics and everything. And he um, has a very successful face transplant program, but had trouble getting two women that came to him to get transplanted in Paris. Uh, long story beyond this hour, he calls me up in his French accent, Scott, you know you have a very good program there. I'm wondering if I could send you two women that are quadrimembranal amputees, no arms, no legs, like Lindsay, like Zion, to consider for transplant. So he flew over from Paris to Philadelphia. This is a young woman, same story, became septic, and for nine years had no arms, no legs. And we worked her up, and when the call came to me from Gift of Life, I called her. She was in Corsica, flew back to Paris, flew here, and within 14 hours of me calling her in Europe, she had, she was underway to have her arms transplanted. And so here's her function, like Lindsay below the elbow. Not bad, huh? Not bad. So, so then her friend, Priscilla is from Bordeaux. And so uh, Lynn, I think uh, Laura was in like uh, 17, in February of 19, I was in Florida, got the call. You see this woman has no arm below the elbow, no legs below the knee and a partial hand that doesn't work. So here we are with her um in 2019 she had she lost she lost her arms and legs six months after she gave birth to her third son and was in a coma in a hospital for six months she didn't see her baby and when she woke up she had no arms or legs again a septic episode of infection and here she is for the first time in eight years putting on makeup. She has a wonderfully supportive husband, three boys, and she came from Bordeaux. It's interesting, when I got the call from Gift of Life, she was on her way with her family and vacationing. And instead of coming from France, she was landing at Kennedy Airport. Landed, and I called her and I said, we have hands for you. Where are you? 
He said, I am in Kennedy coming for vacation. I said, come to Philadelphia right away. So here she is. This is the first time in how many years you can do this? <laughs> long time, very long time. And this is her husband and our team. And this is just leaving the hospital at about three weeks. And uh, because she had tendons and muscles in her left hand, she was able to hold her makeup brush and, and put her makeup on. And of course, she was portrayed in Paris. And then here is Laurent Lanteri uh, following her. And you see her radial nerve starts to work. This is pretty early just a few months after her surgery. And we have to wait for the nerves to grow into the muscles from the donor. So distal transplant on the left. So of course we had to wait for the muscles to grow in. So this is very early on, but I'll show you her. This is the group in Paris match. Now these BCA patients are patients of uh, Lanteri. Uh, and uh, let me just see if I can move this. This is Laurent. These two patients, these three patients have had hand transplants. And here's Laura and Priscilla, my, my patients. They look pretty good, huh? With these hands. And so um, the next chapter is certainly more children. And this is a little boy from Children's Hospital again, like Zion. And Zion's showing him how he can use the cell phone. And these parents are considering whether they should go ahead. We've done lots of research and we're working on vascularized joint transfers uh, as an alternative to just a whole arm transplant. Uh, these are the patients that have been transplanted around the world, uh, probably about 120 or 130 over the last 20 years. And let me have you watch this video. Bill, can you hear? If you can maybe turn up your volume. Diane Harvey. Now we can hear. Hand and leg below the knee. Willing to try the still rare procedure. Sur les conseils du professeur Montieri, Laura s'inscrit sur la liste des États-Unis. Hand transplant surgery, a procedure so delicate and rare. Giving Lindsay new hands, real ones from a donor. There's, there's an expression in surgery. Preparation is the only shortcut you need. Our hands are endlessly expressive. They help us convey thoughts and feelings. Soon. Uh oh. Sorry. Sorry about that. Conseil du professeur Montieri. Laura s'inscrit sur la liste de des États-Unis. Hand transplant surgery, a procedure so delicate and rare. Giving Lindsay new hands, real ones, from a donor. There, there's an expression in surgery. Preparation is the only shortcut you need. Our hands are endlessly expressive. They help us convey thoughts and feelings. Soothe with a gentle touch. An 
enable us to care for ourselves and for others. There's perhaps no better way we express ourselves than through our hands. Living a life without hands, a person loses a sense of self. Independence is challenged. Dependent on others for the most basic tasks, it is impossible not to become isolated from the outside world. A vital method for establishing human connection is lost. I've accepted the fact that my feet are gone. Like that's successful to me. My hand is not, it's still not. In my dreams, I always have my hand. I know from the experience we've had at Penn with patients who have hand transplants that just the mere fact that their body image is restored, uh, they can wave, they can gesticulate like I'm doing when I'm speaking. That's a pretty profound thing when you, you think about it. As one of only a few medical centers in the world where this surgery is performed, Penn Medicine is breaking new ground for transplant patients by connecting the top medical experts locally and around the world to conquer new frontiers in the emerging field of vascularized composite alloy transplantation, the transplant of body parts, such as hands and faces, to recipients who have lost these parts. The discipline of vascularized composite alloy transplantation uses an operating microscope to guide the connection of arteries, veins, and nerves. It is a new discipline, as innovative and exciting as any in medicine today. Hours and hours of surgical rehearsal and practice over two years time allow the team to prepare for each patient's operation. Envisioning the possibilities has become the life's work of Penn surgeon, Dr. L. Scott Levin. I trained uh, first uh, did fusion general surgery where I was exposed to pediatric surgery. And then I trained in orthopedics and did my pediatric orthopedic surgery at the Shriners Hospital System. I did all the congenital hand surgery at Duke for almost 20 years, then came to Philadelphia and being trained both in orthopedics and plastic surgery and doing lots of pediatric microsurgery, pediatric hand surgery, um, pediatric reconstructive surgery. The world of hand surgery, of course, is in adults and children. This is an absolute passion of mine, and uh, I've always loved that. And this is just the next extension of hand transplant surgery. Connecting all the dots to make this complex, multidisciplinary surgery a success is a monumental undertaking. By marshalling the best and brightest in their respective disciplines, Dr. Levin has assembled a team that is second to none and orchestrated it to perfection. And seeing the acronym is together, everyone is before. And I always believe that. Now, this is a test of many entities our internal medicine colleagues, uh, anesthesia, nursing, social work, pharmacy. Uh, these kinds of operations touch everyone in the health system. So, we have really incredible surgical talent. Zion made history, becoming the first ever child recipient for a double hand transplant. The procedure taking a long road to recovery marked with a rigorous therapy regimen. Earlier this month, he got to throw a pitch at the Baltimore Orioles game. Laura s'écrit du tapot plié ses nouvelles mains. Elle commence à plier ses doigts, à bouger ses poignets, à tenir des objets. So have you looked yet? No. That only looks down at one thumb. They feel like normal fingers. You know, normal hands. This is more than we could ever hope for. Your blood pressure is good. All the parameters are good related to how the blood flow is in and out of her new arms. I mean, this is a, if you will, a picture perfect course so far. What has happened at Penn Medicine is not science fiction. It is real science involving real people here, now, today. As in any emerging field, there is still much more to be learned. But with Dr. Levin's leadership in this highly specialized discipline, 
and medicine as going beyond excellence and eminence to preeminence, giving his patients a chance they could only dream of a short time ago, to reconnect with others and with the world. So uh, this brings me sort of to the end of the story of uh, VCA, uh, the future in limb reconstruction. I, I hope if we can solve some of the immunologic barriers, uh, for better medicines or strategies to prevent rejection, nobody knows more about that than all of you. Uh, it's part of our regenerative medicine uh, <clears throat> direction in healthcare delivery. Uh, orthoplastic surgery is the term that combines the principles and practices of orthopedics uh, and plastic surgery to clinical problems simultaneously. And uh, I've never been more enthusiastic about VCA. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure to have met all of you and, and be with you. And I want to thank you for inviting me. And uh, to Jim Gleason, uh, you know, I hope that the those around the country or the world on the YouTube or the profile you have of your trio uh, will see this and, and help us along uh, and be advocates. Uh, this is certainly very different than the transplants you have. But as I said, I stand on the shoulders of giants and really uh, you as an audience tonight, as I said, when people like Soloway or, or Brian, you walk into the clinic and I'm seeing you for carpal tunnel or a hangnail, and I find out you're a transplant patient, I just sort of light up. And so it's been a journey that I've been on. Uh, we have an incredible team here at Penn, my partners, the nurses, you know, all the people that make this go, Howard, Nathan, Gift of Life, and then the UNOS and the whole, you know, the global transplant community, people like Lanteri in Paris. And, you know, I have friends in India who do this. And there are only a few centers now around the world that keep at it, but almost... Uh, Many, many countries have done this uh, hand transplant stuff. And uh, we got to fight because it's not covered by insurance or Medicare or Medicaid. And so we're trying to get funding for the select patients like Lindsay. I mean, uh, I'm not going to ask you to project because you're all my heroes, but just think you had a, a family member that got sick and lost his or her arms and legs. And uh, this is now a possibility to give them back the one word that I'll leave you with that I learned from Laurent Lanteri about hand transplant, face transplant, and that word is dignity. That word is dignity, to have a patient live independently, again, after being dependent without arms or legs. That, to me, is what, what I do this for, and providing that to a patient. Uh, and I say I'm smiling at all of you categorically. There's nothing, I mean, dignity is one thing, but living and holding the hand of your loved one and seeing your families, God love you all, but uh, take away somebody's independence and you take away their dignity, that's, that would be hard for me to live with. So I want to close on an upbeat note, thanking you all for your attention, uh, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Dr. Levin, wow. I mean incredible stuff. And I really am honored to have you join us tonight and explain on a whole other level what's going on in this area. Uh, I'll ask you if you can stop sharing your screen so we can bring everybody up. I'm yep, sure there you go. Thank you. I'm sure we have some questions um, from the group tonight. Does anybody have a question that they would like to ask Dr. Levin? Jim? But doctor, I know with all our organs, there's a time limit <clears throat> when they can be out of body. How does that work with VCA, especially the hands that you're talking about? Uh, you had people way over in Europe coming over. Must be uh, how how long can they be disconnected? It's from a great home? it's a great question. You know, we use uh, University of Wisconsin solution. Um, you know, our European patients were able to be. Uh, within range, meaning here, before we did the procurement. So, you know, we usually have about, I don't know, Jim, up to 20 hours sometimes before 
all the different teams from around the country can come for the procurement. And so when, uh, for example, Laura got the call, you know, we knew she could be here in 14 hours. The, the, the answer to your question though, we have about four to six hours of cold ischemia. So within about four hours, we got to get the blood vessels hooked up um, no more than about six. So that's uh, how, we, how we roll. The other thing that really amazes me, thinking of what the donor family goes through hmm. in giving permission for that donation. Do you ever get to engage or meet the donor family later on or anything like that to be able to speak at all to what they've gone through? I think Bill, or, or maybe I, I apologize for not remembering, uh, well, Bill knows his donor family. And um, I believe uh, that Lindsay, you have to reach out to the families, as you all probably know, through Gift of Life. I don't, I, I don't make that connection at all. The technical, regulatory, ethical aspects of that, that all goes through Gift of Life. Okay. That, that makes sense. And so it's equally anonymous in that sense. Um, I, I, would, I can only imagine, I've met one of the face transplant recipients here in Philadelphia through the Gift of Life uh, event they had. And I was absolutely amazed to hear the horrific situation that resulted in the need and what yeah. she went through and so forth. And yet she stood there and she said, if she had to do all over again, she'd do exactly the same thing, even to the event that caused it. Can you yeah. talk about the strength it must take for one of these recipients to face one, their loss, and then to have the strength, despite that loss emotionally and every other way, to be the successes you're sharing with us? Well, it's a, it's a good point. Um, you know, we've worked up, worked up, meaning evaluated, uh, Jim, over the years, a lot of patients, and, and they've either decided not to go forward they're not uh, a candidate because of their, uh, you know, uh, body function. Psychologically, they have to be stable. They also have to have support system of family, people like that. So there are a lot of factors involved. Um, but Lindsay S. deserves a medal because she was our first transplant patient. Now, she wasn't the first patient in the world to undergo transplant. We've done it successfully four times. There's another candidate from Switzerland that we're about to transplant, hopefully this fall. Everybody, fingers crossed. But Jim, coming back to the psychology, we test, retest. When we're finished testing, we test again and sort of put people through, and I'll use this in a supportive way, the paces to just share how dire, not dire, but how complex this is the lifelong requirement for immunosuppression, the need to be compliant with therapy. Uh, you know, that's not true for heart, lung, kidney, right? You get the organ in and God willing, you walk out of the hospital and Bill's riding his bicycle 100 miles uh, and, and so forth. But the hand transplant patients have to do up to two years of therapy, hours a day to get these, get these hands working. So you know, it's the, it's the thing, even if I would tell you, and I'm just guessing, as well as you all were probably informed, I mean incredibly well informed by modern transplant medicine, you probably discovered some things that made you think after the fact. I, I don't know. I'm speculating. I mean, we don't like surprises for our patients, but... Um, we really spend a lot of time counseling the families, counseling the patients. Are you sure you want to do this? We have independent patient advocates that are not family members, say from the lay public or, you know, a third party, because when they consent, the problem is not the problem, but the fact is, and, and I say this respectfully to all of you, Somebody who doesn't have hands will agree to just about anything to get hands. Um, somebody who's going to die of heart failure, Bill, and I say this with the greatest respect and meeting you for the first time, you know, that's pretty desperate. You know, I have a brother with advanced cancer who's not going to survive his cancer. If, if I thought he could have a liver transplant to 
save him, right? There wouldn't be a question that he would have a liver transplant. So all of you know, and that's why this, this honor for me to talk to all of you, it's daunting. But what's the alternative, right? And that's why uh, in responding to Jim's question, we make sure informed consent is so stringent. And, and when those patients go ahead, we don't just say, here, your transplants, have a nice day. The hovering, the therapy, the cheerleading, the, you know, all four of these patients have my cell phone. They call me at three in the morning, Christmas day, I'm there for them. That's the responsibility that transplant surgeons take on. And all of you have transplant physicians who might not be your surgeon anymore. You know, Brian, your pulmonologist or Jim or Bill, your cardiologist or Susan, you have a kidney maybe you're a nephrologist and so forth. But to me, you know, I'm, I'm it. And Ben Chang and a few other people. But at, at the end of the day, I'm like, uh, I, I would never liken myself to John, John, uh, Tom Starzl or Joe Murray, but it's my program. So if, if something fails or rejection, Lindsay required a kidney at 10 years after her hand. She, her kidneys failed. So I lived that with her. And oh my God, I thought she'll hate me forever, but she knew about this. She knew about the liability and thank goodness in, in Texas, we found her a kidney. And now she has her hands and she has a functioning kidney. But she was sick as, the day, as daylights when she lost her limbs and you know her kidneys just didn't sustain the uh, degree of immunosuppression she needed, which is similar to a kidney. That's about the levels we do. Uh, Bill, I think you're, I'm just guessing, are you just on TAC? Uh, no, I'm on mycophenolate as well. MMF, okay. Yeah. And, you know, what I wanted to say is certainly one of the things that I realized after transplant is I couldn't ride my bike in congestive heart failure. And I never dreamt that I would ever ride my bike again. And mm. for me, that was my life. That's my therapy. That's what completes me, right? And I have the greatest respect um, for people like you that give us back something that we don't have. And in your case, the dignity that you give your patients back through the surgeries that you do is just incredible. And we're certainly honored to have you. And the one question really that is in the back of my mind, especially in a case like Zion, right? So he's going to uh, grow into a young man and then into an adult. And how do his hands know to grow with him? They're growing. The growth plates called the physis, the epiphysis, they're open. We knew that from the pediatric replant experience where child traumatically loses his hand, we put it back on, it grows. So he's, he's growing. He's growing like a weed. He's 14 now. That's just incredible. And the one question I had for you is, obviously, the way that medicine is evolving, the technology and everything, if you had a crystal ball and you could look into it, what do you think you're going to see in your lifetime? What's on the horizon in this area? I want this to be mainstream. I want VCA to join heart, kidney, liver, pancreas. Number two, I want medical science to discover strategies for immuno, immunosuppression that can be less toxic, uh, things that are more um, uh, physiologic. Um, I'd like us to solve the problem of despite perfect patient compliance, a better understanding of what may happen uh, and the need for retransplant after, you know, 15 or 20 years chronic rejection or, you know, the organs, whether it's a hand or a face or, a, uh, you know, another organ uh, having to be retransplanted. Um, those are, those are some things. It's, it's not just about VCA bill. It's about what we want to all do for the field of transplant. But again, standing on the ch shoulders of giants, 54, and 67, and then, you know, Max Dubernard in 1998, 22 years ago, the first hand transplant was done. It was a technical success. The transplant it was a therapeutic disaster. The hand was amputated a year later because the patient was non-compliant. He didn't take his medicines. He didn't do his therapy. And it set the field back. So, boy, 
Soloway, do I have hopes for the field? Uh, you bet. And, um, you know, the, the next many years of my career, as long as I am on earth and practicing, I'm very impassioned about uh, bringing this further. Uh, you know, I just have to share that with you. And, uh, you know, I'd say challenging to your group and trio, naturally, Jim, anything, you know, we, that you can do to help us uh, continue to be part of you. You know, I'd ask you to call up Bo Pomahawk at the Brigham and ask him about his face transplant program or Brian Gassman. You think this is important? Uh, talk to Bo Pomahawk or Brian Gassman at the Cleveland Clinic or, um, you know, Kurt Citrullo at uh, Harvard uh, for penile transplant, or Rick Rudette for penile transplant, um, for our wounded warriors, you know, to restore dignity and uh, gender affirmation and things like that. Uh, this is a field that we need. And then the other thing is, you know, we're doing, we have a uterus transplant program here. So the congenital uh, abnormalities in women who can't conceive, we've done, a couple of uterus transplants here, we've had three babies born to women who never thought they would be able to deliver a baby. They don't have to adapt. They've, they've gotten donors from either a friend or a deceased donor and they're little babies uh, nine months later. So, you know, this is a field, this VCA field, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll fight on forever. Uh, but, you know, there again, there's some challenges uh, because it's not like saving its quality of life uh impact and that's the difference and if we can utilize your group in any way and i'm putting pressure on you soloway to at least continue the awareness of what we can do with you and your colleagues and robert and i see john on here and susan and steve and brian and sue and, and jim that would mean a lot to me that would be the only sort of payback is to keep this aspect of organ transplant um, moving forward. And we're, we're at risk for it not moving forward if we can't get it funded. Bob, In this, the question? Yeah, no, I, I, have, I just have a couple of comments. As some of you already know, because I put it in the chat, um, although I recently rolled off the board of the OPTN and UNOS, I was, on the, uh, I was the uh, visiting board member for the last two years of the VCA committee. Uh, so Bohan, uh, I know a little bit, but in his case, it was all virtual. Linda Sedalis, I, yeah. I know uh, yeah. as well, because she chaired the uh, committee the year yeah. before. And, and you know, you said a few words uh, earlier today, which is absolutely true uh, in, in my view, and that is this needs to be more mainstream VCA. And, and I think there, there has been an awful lot of hard work done by the VCA committee yeah. and others uh, who have, have approved uh, VCA to become, uh, to, to get into the, to the mainstream. Mm -hmm. um, and just one, one last comment. And uh, the last board meeting uh, that I was a part of, I guess it was really the executive committee where, uh, well, no, I guess the board meeting, where we, there was approval of a, a couple of dozen or more uh, VCA programs in hospitals around the country. Yeah, I can speak to that, Bob, if you want. Sure, I mean, I think it's, it's really exciting. And, you know, I, I, I don't know the specific uh, uh, areas you know, in which yeah. you're seeking approval, yeah. but yeah. it's certainly you know, a great trend, let's put it that way. Yeah, the problem is that all these programs, they're terrific, right? They apply, but the 90% of them haven't done a transplant. And they might not have the fiscal support from their health system to do a transplant. So you have to demonstrate that you have a team or a hospital, uh, you have this, you have that. But actually getting the program up and running, there are very few programs now. Uh, there's like... Uh, Let's see, uh, probably only two or three programs in hand in the country. So there you have it, Mr. Soloway. 
Does anybody else have a, a question that they would like to ask Dr. Levin? Well, with that, I just again want to thank you for joining us and sharing um, your passion with us, uh, giving us a bigger window to look through in regards to what's happening in the area of VCA and uh, what we can look forward to in the future and know that no uh, a pioneer in this area. We're really glad to have you in Philly. It's an absolute yeah. pri privilege and good luck with your organization and uh, you know anything else you need to advance uh, transplantation in the United States, you can call on me. We Thank really you. appreciate it. Have a good night. Thank you for the opportunity. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Bye.